lifestyle. Sports cards and we live now. Jeremy Lee in the building and every guest that you ever needed. Sports cards after hours keep the hobby heated. Updates hobby talk like you never seen it. Sports cards live and none could ever beat it. Sports cards is a lifestyle. Sports cards and we live now. Welcome to another episode of Sports Cards Live with your host, Jeremy Lee. All right, here we go, everybody. Welcome to episode number 105 of Sports Cards Live. It is Saturday night, July the 10th, 2021, and my name is Jeremy Lee. Before we do get to tonight's episode, I do want to thank last week's guest, Tim Getch, founder and CEO of ComC, for joining the show, as well as the After Hours episode, Ryan Nolan from Breakout Cards. Tim Field did some really tough questions. From the chat, I want to thank him for coming on. And Ryan shared his card show experiences and is our card show correspondent. I want to let everybody know to check out past episodes of Sports Cards Live on the YouTube channel. You are sure to find something there that you will find interesting. I also want to thank Joe Perot, Yamwax, Billy Celio, and Ben Carlos for joining me earlier today for Hobby Palooza. We had a lot of fun. What a great event that is. Also want to let you guys know next Saturday the schedule will be a little bit different as on the early show, Adam Gray, the Real 27 guy, will join me as we watch the PWCC Premier Auction go into extended bidding. We'll provide some commentary and analysis on the 66 lots in that auction. Also, after the show tonight, episode 106 will go on with Frankie Gonzalez. He has a hobby, a hobby shop in San Juan, Puerto Rico and is a passionate Michael Jordan collector. And next week as well, after the PWCC auction, episode 107 with guests Peter Pacman and Slabby Sosa. I do want to let everybody know we've surpassed 3,200 subscribers. Thanks to each and every one of you. You know I appreciate that. If you're not yet subscribed to the channel, please go ahead and do so. Greatly appreciate that. Shout out all the podcast listeners. I know I, know I do it every episode, but I do really appreciate you guys. And I know they're, you're a strong force. So thank you for all of your uh, listening time. Shout out the big three hockey on Instagram for their support. Be sure to give them a follow on Instagram. And I also want to shout out John from Slab Shelf for sending me that unit right there over my shoulder, displaying some cards, awesome uh, gesture, and a really cool product that he has out there right now. And finally, we are now going to get to tonight's first guest of the evening, whose earliest hobby memory was when he traded for a 1983 Tops. Milt Wilcox card, thinking he was a speedy outfielder, but he was actually a lousy pitcher. But And the cost, schoolyard gold in the form of a bag of Doritos. He got away from the hobby in college, and then in 2015, he founded the sneaker marketplace StockX. He rediscovered the hobby in 2018. He's built himself up a pretty nice collection. His favorite teams, the Philadelphia Eagles, Sixers, and Phillies. His favorite athletes are Allen Iverson. Charles Barkley and Randall Cunningham, originally from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, currently hailing from Detroit, Michigan, but moving later this month to Austin, Texas. Let's bring him out. Josh Luber, welcome to Sports Cards Live. How are you doing tonight, my friend? I am unbelievable. Thank you very much for having me. Hey, man, it is uh, it is my pleasure. It's great. It is great to have you. And I thank you for uh, for making some time tonight and the other night as well for me. So. Uh I got, I got, a, I got a couple of things before I got. I know you got a million questions for me. I got three things we gotta, gotta get real quick before we start. So one, um, as I'm sure a lot of your guests are doing as well, um, I have two bids that end in 25 minutes on Golden's auctions. So uh, I got alarms uh, set. So we'll, we'll all take a, a quick break to refresh our bids in, uh, in 24 minutes. Um, two, I'll apologize ahead of the time. I have no cards with me as i am uh, in transit all my cards are in uh are in storage but i do have this little um otani uh, uh little figure that's as close as i have to, to any cards um and three and i say this with with all due respect but has anyone ever said that that you look like dr evil because <laughs> <laughs> like you you have the same mole as mike myers <laughs> and like and it's the gray shirt and i was like oh man i was like who does he look like and i uh, was like it couldn't it couldn't and then the last second i was like it's Dr. Evil. So it's it's uh I'm 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 honored to be here with um with uh with with you in uh, well, in that capacity. Yeah, thanks man. Thanks for calling me Dr. Evil. <laughs> much much appreciated. Yeah. Sorry, it was like thanks. Thanks, it's the bro. great shirt. It's the gray shirt. It's the, it's hey, a look, I got, great I got as much hair as you do, so we're very yeah. good. We're good. <laughs> well, so two things on that. First thing is that um 
I I have owned uh, two Sphinx cats in my lifetime, uh, as Doctor Evil did. Yeah, yeah. And actually, let me, let me show you something. They 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 both they're both no longer with us. But I I pulled this out of a box of uh, Upper Deck Goodwin, and I'm like, well, that was meant to be. So I yeah I keep it displayed as a that's as amazing. A memento to my my cats were they were named Monster and Momo, and uh, so I have this as a little memento that I pulled myself, which was really cool. The second thing is I've never heard that, but who I have heard that I look like is the actor's name is Corey Stoll. I'm not sure if you're familiar yeah. with Corey. Yeah. Yeah, he, totally. The West Wing, I think he was in among among many. Uh, Ant-Man, he was in Ant-Man. Yeah, well and he's um, uh, he had a big role this last season in Billions, which oh, was, right. uh, was probably his most notable recent role. As He was, he was kind of the, you know, the, the, the foil, uh, the bad guy foil all last season. So, yeah. Yeah, my wife and I, we haven't got to that season yet, but uh, I'm looking forward to it. And I mean, you know, he's a good looking guy, but I've got I, I've got one one leg up on him for sure. So uh, but, yeah. but I don't know where I rank against uh, Dr. Evil, man. That's the first time. It's I've a great shirt. I was like, man, I was like, I, could, I couldn't like the whole your whole intro. I was like, I was blanking. And then right as you clicked, on, I was like, yeah. Sorry. There it was, eh? There it was. Uh, All right. Well, hey, we're, we're, off, okay. we're off. We're off to a great solid start uh -huh. here so far. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, man, again, thanks for coming on. You've obviously done some great things in, in hobbies, not just, uh, so well, not sports cards. Maybe we're going to hear a bit about that. You built yourself a bit of a collection, as I understand. Uh, we share a, a similar passion, one of the threads within it. But you also, uh, you're the founder of StockX, the preeminent sneaker marketplace. I want to get into that. But before we do, just I, I alluded to, uh, you know, trading a bag of Doritos for your first baseball card, but just take us through a, a little bit of your, your experience as a youngster in the hobby. Yeah. You know, this is uh, one of my most fun things to talk about because it's the thing that it sort of ties us all together. Right. I, I say this all the time and I've said the same thing on the sneaker side of it, which is, you know, I'm 43 years old. I have the exact same stories. Every other 43 year old, uh, you know, coming back into cards. I collected cards, you know, heavy during the junk wax era. Um, you know, 83 tops was the first card that I ever, you know, bought um, or first card I ever, ever acquired. Um, and, uh, you know, I graduated uh, high school in, in 1995 and I left all my cards in my parents' basement and I went on to college and, and, uh, and forgot about them and forgot about the hobby really for, for years. And um, frankly, it was only because of StockX um, that I was a little bit early back to the, the game because we were just always looking for what other products might make sense to put on stock X. And so it was in uh, like mid to 20 uh, mid to late 2018 that I got back into to cards um, through that, the lens of looking at it stock X and then, and then personally myself, but you know, and, and you know, I'm, I, this on the sneaker side, we all have the same sneaker story, which is, you know, we all grew up, we all played basketball and Jordan played. We all wanted Air Jordans. Our mother wouldn't buy us a pair of Air Jordans. As soon as I got some money, I bought a pair of Jordans. Like we all have the same story on that. And so, um, you know, that part, and I'm sure you deal with it all the time as well. Uh, it really does sort of bind us and is really a real part of why all of this is happening. The industry is growing where it's at. And I'll be in conversations with people these days and telling them about the card market coming back. And mid conversation, people say, "Oh, hold on, I need to text my my father and ask him to find our cards in our basement." You know, uh, I, this literally happened to me this afternoon. Um, and I was at a party and saying, and, and I mean, word for word, the same thing. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm no different. I get the same stories everywhere. So you alluded to stock X. What I'm curious about there is, you know, you founded the company. Uh, I believe you have a co-founder. I think a, a, your friend Dan. But how did you like, what was the, what was, what was the, the moment where the light bulb went off and you're like, Hey, there's, there's an opportunity here. And how did you identify that opportunity? StockX will IPO um, sometime soon, maybe the end of this year, maybe beginning of next year. And it'll probably IPO, who knows, six, seven, eight, ten billion $10 billion. I mean, some absurd number. Um, Never in a million years was that the plan. Did we think it was that sort of thing? Um, it was very, very much one foot in front of the other. It was very much uh, the natural progression of being interested in sneakers, seeing a very small uh, opportunity for me. Um, I was, um, I had, so I'm a startup guy. So I've started to run four other startups before StockX and none of them had anything to do with sneakers or trading cards. Um, and uh, I left the last startup and I shut down the last startup during the crash of 0809. 
and I took a job at IBM and I never in a million years thought I'd, if you're a startup guy and you go work at IBM, the first thing you do is you start working on shit on the side. And so I'm, you know, basically looking for side projects while I'm at IBM and I was doing all this data work as any other consultant would be at that stage. And I literally had a thought, I was like, man, I wonder if I could get all some sneaker data just to play with my own amusement, just to see what I could do with it. And that became the side project, which became a sneaker price guide that eventually became the jumping off point to create the sneaker stock market, which became StockX, which became, you know, what it is. So it was literally a, uh, a side project for myself that, you know, you take one foot in front of the other and somehow this is going to, you know, I don't know, a $10 billion company that, that's come out of it. But it, it, it truly is the way that the best things start, which is just, hey, there's one very specific thing that I'm interested in or I want to build and building upon it from there. So. It's a good, yeah, it's a great story, man. I mean, the one, you know, you're, you're an inspiring guy. And I, I mean that because I've heard you say that, and this, this, this is really, I'm going to ask you to talk about this because I think a lot of people need to hear it, but I've heard you say that ideas are worthless, which, you know, a lot of people would say, how can you say ideas are worthless? But you go on to say ideas are worthless. The only thing that matters is execution. So speak, yeah. speak about that. And like, you know, why, why you, why you say that? Why you believe that? Yeah. Um, well, a couple of things. Um, let's just start with, with my experience and, and the most obvious one. So StockX, we didn't make any of this up. Like all we did at every stage here is just copy how the stock market works. Um, the idea that you could buy or sell consumer goods the same way that people buy or sell um, stocks and, and, and equities um, first of all, it was not unique. Other people have tried it, and people, including people in the trading card industry ahead of us, right? Uh, you may be familiar with the pit. Yeah. Um, you know, the pit was, I mean, that is stock X. Like that is exactly stock X. Now, did we do a better job? Was it because it was a different time? Was it because it's a different team, different technology, different product that we were using sneakers, other, but like it is the exact same idea, which is take how the stock market works and apply it to consumer goods. We happen to start with sneakers and we moved into other products, including um, including trading cards. But, you know, it's even more important than, um, you know, than, than at the highest level in terms of, you know, building businesses and successful businesses. But um, it's what holds back a lot of entrepreneurs or would be entrepreneurs in the beginning, which is uh, people are, are scared to share their ideas. They think that someone's going to steal their ideas. Um, you know, the number of people that um, ask for my advice or help or eyes on something um, as an entrepreneur is um, it's humbling and uh, and it's and it's and it's it's nice and it, and it feels good but then someone will say hey you know I have this amazing idea I'd love if you could uh, give me some advice on it and then ask me to sign an NDA to look at that like nobody's gonna sign an NDA to look at. and by the way nobody's gonna steal your idea because first of all I'm sure whatever the idea is a hundred other people have had it the question is how are you going to be able to execute it better than someone else? But here's the other thing, right? Is that if you have this idea and it's such a great idea and you present it to me and I decide to steal it and run with it. First of all, do I, I'm not doing anything else in my life that I'm just going to sit here and take your idea. And that's what I'm going to spend my time on. And second of all, that I'm therefore somehow better able to execute your idea. Like all of that, just, it just doesn't align. And the only way that you refine ideas, that you find business partners, investors, uh, um, employees, all that is by sharing those ideas and talking about them and iterating through them and stuff like that. And that process is my, like the, the number one advice I give to any entrepreneur ask me, which is talk to everybody about everything. That's how these things evolve. That's how you find people to work with, work with you. And if you have the idea that, that ideas are sacred, that will never happen because you will sit there and hold it to yourself and not not share with anyone else. So that's just generally been, and by the way, like it, it is a, it is a very natural um, uh, instinct to think that way. Um, but it, 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 it couldn't be more the truth. And, and I, I can't, you, the, you will hard press to find a, a successful entrepreneur business person who doesn't, who doesn't understand that. And yeah, that's all, that's all really, really good information to know that you can take your idea to somebody who you think might steal and they're not going to, and it all makes great sense. But I want to ask you this, because the difference between a successful entrepreneur and a dreamer, I do believe is going to be, you know, among other things, execution. Totally. What, you know, 
what is the, if someone were to come to you with a great idea, but they're not asking for you to either steal the idea or to help them, the, the question I'm going to ask is, what is the best way to execute or how do you execute? What what advice would you give them with, to that question? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll build on what I just said, right? The starting point is, um, I, I basically always say some version of, of, of two things. One is what I just said, which is talk to everybody about everything. Because that's, again, how you find ideas, find partners, find investors, et cetera. Um, but the other thing is some version of, and not to be sort of cliche, particularly for Nike, but it's just do something. Like I hesitate to say, like, just do it. Like, just do something. There is um, a, a, a billion dollar company doesn't get built by going from zero to a billion. It's it's step by step. And um, you don't necessarily know where that's going to lead. For me, in the very beginning of, of StockX, I was working at IBM and I was spending all this time cleaning data. I was I, I, I figured out a way to collect eBay data and was spending all this time very similar to what, by the way, because I know you're, you're friends with them, the guys um, at Card Ladder have been doing, right? Because they've, they're they building their price guide off of eBay data. We had built our price guide at, Stock, at StockX or at Campus off of eBay data. And man, I was spending hours and hours and hours and, and literally months, 18 months, probably all I was doing was cleaning Excel. And I had no idea of where this would necessarily lead to. But I knew that I just had to be doing something to push this idea forward, to put myself in a position of who knows what would happen next. Because what's the alternative? The alternative is I don't, like watching TV and, and, and going out. Like You need to be doing something to move it forward and it doesn't matter what it is. And you're never gonna be like, hey, I'm going to just build this billion dollar company from scratch. Like, no, it, it takes a regression of, of many, 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 many small things. So. You know, talk to everybody about everything and, and, and just do something. Just do something. That, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Just, just do it. How are you doing for your uh, your auction bidding? Uh, well, we got we have uh, uh, 12 minutes left here. Right. OK, or actually, it looks like no, it looks like the, the there's there's one card that I really want. I'll tell you if I, if I hit it, it looks like it's already been hit once. So. We'll All right. I'm going to uh, well, you take a second. I'm going to okay. we're going to go through some comments. Say hello to some of the chat here. Yeah, we got troublemaker cards. Great to have you. Rocco Rosado, always great to see you, Rocco. He says, it's been a hobby palooza of a day as usual. Jeremy and Sports Cars Live lead the way. Thank you, Rocco. We'll now be taking some stock in StockX. Should be another day. Thank you very much, Rocco. Always great to have you. Good evening, Mike Wick. Troy, great to see you again. Hello to Josh. Looking forward to, looking forward to it uh, ourselves. Mike Wick says, I need more friends in the hobby for sure. Hey, you got two right here. Jeff Mc... Well, I'll speak for myself. I won't speak for Josh. Jeff McMahon, great to see you. Todd McDonald says, good evening, Jaron Josh. Great show this afternoon. You make it look easy. Such a pro. Thank you so much, Todd. That's really, really nice. Joe, good evening to you. And thanks for joining me on the panel earlier today. We got Charles from Card Canucks in the house. Good evening, Charles. Colin says, evening, Jeremy. Thanks for the video today with the panel. Looking forward to tonight's show with Josh. Thank you, Colin. Mike Wick says, go Phillies. That's for you, Josh. Good evening, Michael Ham. Great to see you. I've seen you all day, Michael, in the chats. I was uh, I was consuming a lot of it myself throughout the day. No, Eric, that is not going to last. You guys will not be referring to me as Doctor Evil. That 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 stops right now. I'm gonna. I got this guy to blame if that sticks. You. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, here we go, Troy. Here we go. That that that's that's what everybody wants. Max Norris, good evening to you. Mike Wick says, where did you get the Raider rookie shirt? I have to get one. This came from Panini. And when I had a couple guys from Panini on the show last year, they sent me a shirt, which was very, very nice. Uh, Zed says, are cards still popular? Yeah, just come to the expo and find out. Yeah, Joe says, who remembers the pit? I do remember the pit. I remember when it first came out. I thought this is, it was around the time of the first ETOPS back in like 2000, maybe even the late 90s, actually. Definitely. Angie, great to see you again. How about the Habs? Yeah, the Habs were, were good, but they weren't good enough. But Tampa was a great team for sure. Rich Frank says the pit is still flipping cards. Zed wants to know, will StockX get into NFTs? You want to you speak to that, Josh? Well, I, I left in September. So as of uh, as September, most of the world had never even heard of an NFT. Um, so I, I can't tell you about anything I know specifically, but um, it is a, a, a obvious extension of, of what's going on. So I wouldn't be surprised. But, you know, I'm not involved anymore in, in leadership over there. And we're going to get to that a little bit later, everybody. Anthony George says, uh, always with the best guests and content. Thank you so much, Anthony, and welcome to the show. Good evening, Adam Holgate. 
<clears throat> Adam Holgate. Indy Card Exchange says, Josh, please don't win any Jordan inserts on the auction tonight. I want to have a shot. Uh, great to have you on the show, Andy and Rich Frank. Good evening to you. All right. So we still got some time before your bidding. I do have a card that I, you know, that uh, Dr. Thomas Newman collection is also uh, ending tonight on Memory Lane. Um, and he's got that couple beautiful Babe Ruths, a few others. I'm, I'm actually in on two cards over there. And one of them, I was the the leading bidder uh, before we before we came on here tonight. So we'll see how, how that goes. Uh, and Frankie, who will be joining me later tonight after this episode. Good evening, Frankie. Great to have you. Max Norris, good evening to you. Jeremy and Punk 8828. Yeah, I did see that post that you made there, Josh, of the uh, cyber cyberpunk. Okay, let's let's keep on going. So I really want to, you know, I wanted to pick your brain a bit on how how you see the hobby based on your experience as conceptualizing and founding stock X as you know, I think it gives you a unique perspective from what you've done applying it to the hobby right now. Can you sort of speak to to that that the special lens you have and how you might see it differently than the general public? You mean because of StockX? Yeah, and your experience, not just with founding yeah. it, but your experience there and what insights you may have that others may not. Yeah, what's um, what's really interesting, and uh, I mean, to be frank, what what drove me to to leave StockX um, is there was, there's so many similarities between trading cards today um, and for the past, you know, two years and sneakers, when we started StockX, when, when we were, uh, you know, concepting StockX back in, in 2013, 2014, first of all, it's the same people. It's the exact same, like it is literally the same people, the same generation of people. And I, and like I mentioned before, I'm very much kind of the, the every man have the same story as a lot of us. It's the same supply and demand construct. Um, you have uh, the same uh, scenario where um, prices in the market itself is being driven by more and more people coming back into the market. You know, back in 2013, 2014, I'd get hit up five times a week from people saying, hey, man, can you help me find those Jordans we used to wear in high school? And today it's, hey, can you help me find Jordan rookies and, and everything else? And then you have literally Michael Jordan at the center of both industries. So, you know, you have this, this very similar um, scenario and it, it's um, you also have this the same uh, sort of evolution of these products, sneakers and trading cards, becoming true investable assets. Now, trading cards have actually taken it a step further because sneakers, at the end of the day, are not good long-term investments. They're still just rubber and leather and glue. But trading cards, because of grading, because of standardization, actually are. And so all of those things sort of combined for me to leave StockX to go into the trading card industry because of the similarities, because of the, the stage of it, because of all of those things. Um, and so I don't think I'm unique necessarily in that that view, um, but it is very, very clear, those similarities. And that's an interesting place to, to be starting at. Yeah, no, no, no doubt at all. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I like how you just put it that it's it's the same it's the same people. It's this, you know, Michael Jordan is at the center of the of of both of them. For yeah. I think a lot of people do agree that as the Michael, you know, the Michael Jordan rookie is a great sort of gauge of the of the overall hobby. It's a good beacon just to have an understanding of where things are at. Um, so you know, you mentioned uh, the similarity. You've used the term culture collision uh, in in speaking with me. Even can you can you kind of uh, expand on what you mean by that? Yeah, I mean that's another. Um, sort of good um, sort of example of the similarities and and um, you know I, I give a, a nod to um, uh, to this guy in the hobby who goes by uh, Prism God who runs a um, uh, a show that's coming up actually I think it might be this coming weekend or a week from today um, in Atlanta that he's been calling uh, culture collision and the the higher level idea of the convergence of all these things is also driving the similarities between these industries um, you know. All of the sneakers, um, trading cards, all these collectibles, um, they used to be these very siloed, individual, um, kind of, um, you know, nerdy, uncool things. And, you know, the sneaker kids were over there and the skate kids were over there and the basketball kids there and, tra and trading cards. And you just have this, this convergence of all of it, which was the kind of the future of the internet that promised. But in, you have 
streetwear and high fashion and and sneakers and you have you know trading cards and high finance and um you know and, and trading cards are cool again and the people that create culture you know you see steve aoki for example who's one of the biggest djs in the world is 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 talking about cards and and doing breaks and and logan paul and and all this so like that convergence of all of culture um into trading cards or, or whichever way you want to look at it is a huge driver of this and, and what tells me more than anything that this is still very very early on right by comparison or, or by by analogy StockX today is i don't know four five six times bigger than what we thought the entire resale market was when we started stock x back in 2015 and the reason why is because sneakers sit at the intersection of culture and commerce and that's where trading cards are right now. You see it at the intersection of culture and commerce, and you just don't know how big that can possibly be when those things take hold. Like what happens the first time that, that Kanye, you know, tweets about that he's been buying cards? What happens the first time that Kim Kardashian puts on her Instagram stories, you know, her 2009 upper deck card and says, oh, look how cool, like my rookie card. The, like we have so much like more to go in terms of people and how important this becomes. And we're past the point of no return, at, at least in my view. And so that's, you know, that, that's kind of how I see it's coming. And I think a lot of other people feel the same way. But sorry to go on the rant. I was at, I was at a show in, in Dallas, uh, whatever it was, two, three months ago. And there were tables there selling Air Jordans. There were tables selling sneakers, no cards. There were two or three tables there that were just selling sneakers. I mean, it's like that convergence is, we're already there. It's just a question of, of how much further it goes. It's kind of a perfect storm the way they just sort totally. of nestle, nestle right in there and in, into society and culture. Um, I, I do want to, you know, you, you mentioned how much you think there's there's a ways to go. We're going to come back. I just want to do a couple of quick comments here. We have Brian Gray from Leaf says, Hey guys, I'm bidding too. Love seeing creative business guys in the industry like yourself. Josh, welcome to the show. Uh, Brian, great to have you. Rich Frank, good evening. We got Chris uh, from, from Hard Ladder right there saying hello to, to us. Good evening, Chris. Always great to see you. Joe Perot says, if Josh is an everyman, he's a very smart one. Well, he's either very smart or he just did it. You know, as he said earlier, you got to do it. That's the, the ideas are nothing without execution. So I think that's that's the big takeaway here, I really, really think. Jordan Hudson says, pop count, Chris is in the house. Chris is in the house. So as far as you were saying, you know, you're, you're, you've identified for yourself or you've, you've, you've sensed that there's a ways to go. As you know, we talk, we collectively have talked about the hobby in terms of innings. What inning are we in? People have all sorts mm -hmm. of different opinions, but you've broken it down. And I've heard you break it down. Speaking of Chris, I heard you break it down on his and Josh's crossover show where you meant you broke it down between there's really three different ball games going on at a time here. You've got the people, you've got the prices, and you have the company infrastructure. So I think the co company infrastructure is the most interesting one. And I want to I want to spend some time on that with you. But can we just touch on why you think that? And, and I want to know if you and that when you were on with Josh and Chris, that was a couple months ago now. Yeah. Um, at the time, you said that people as far as people go we're in the fourth and as far as prices go we're in the seventh now i don't know if baseball games go backwards but are we we may not be there more so but let's start with people do you still think that we're yeah. in the fourth i do um i do i i think that um you know a lot of people have looked at um what's been going on in with nfts and, and top shot and crypto and a lot of things to point to uh, potential reasons of why uh, we've seen prices drop in the past couple of months. Um, I actually don't believe that to be the case, but I do believe that that uh, all of that um, uh, slowed down the rate of growth of people coming into the hobby um, because you know an individual is only going to be you know really truly engaged in so many different things, and so it does take away uh, people from that. It doesn't necessarily take away you know, money per se. Um, but so I, I think that that rate of growth of people has slowed down um, a little bit, but it doesn't change my long term uh, view on um, where we will go and, and those people's interests because of it is it, it is just so generational, right? It is so um, like there's so many of us that grew up with it. And there's so, still so many of us that are learning about it. I mean, I literally I mentioned I was at a, a, a friend's house this afternoon. Um, and I was with two guys, both of whom, you know, uh, close to my age and they just hadn't really been exposed to it yet. But 
same thing, you know, they're texting their parents, trying to find their cards and asking the same questions. Um, and then what's so important and why I think that it doesn't stop is, and then like that, the generational part of people's kids doing it. Like my kids are eight and six um, and they're in, they want to open Pokemon packs and they want it like, so I, so I really do think that it's uh, it's still early uh, from a card standpoint or from a, from a people standpoint, there's, there's still a lot more left to come in. And like I said, the cultural part like hits hard if somebody like Kanye or Travis or, or Kim or, or any of these people start to, to talk about it. Um, so but, but, but for prices, right? Like, I, I mean, what happened in, in January, February is, is extraordinary. And that's just a function of how small the, the populations of some of the cards are and how quickly that can happen where it only takes two people to, to, to do that. Um, and so, you know, I thought that it would be another year or so before we reach prices anywhere near what some of that, you know, Jordan's up at, at $700,000. Um, and so did it go backwards? I don't know. I mean, certainly some cards have, have prices have gone backwards since, um, since February. Uh, but whatever it is, we're obviously way past, I mean, for how long were people saying we're in the second inning, right? Like the last three years. So eventually you got to move out of the, the second inning. But um, but the infrastructure of the the companies hasn't, right? Because that happens very, very slowly. In fact, the only company that seems to have progressed um, at all is really PSA. And that's just a function of uh, they've had to because because they've been so crushed with demand. And now you have Nat in there. But you can only, you can only, change companies so quickly right you can't do that they can't do that overnight and maybe there's some progress going on behind the closed doors at at tops or panini or upper deck or or some of the other companies but like i think it's going to be a long time before we see any of that well so let, let's dive into the company infrastructure yep. then uh sort of by by by, by segment i guess uh, we'll start with the grading companies because that's where you started so you know, we've got the incumbents the psa bgs sgc we've got several new ones including some real threats, I would say, like a CSG. Uh, and then you've got all the other new ones. And it, it literally does so feel you think, like you think that CSG is a threat for for cards. I think they're the I think CSG has the best shot at market share uh, comp, uh, out of the pool of new grading companies coming in. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just because of their their scale and their history with with comic books. Or is there a different reason? Well, that's one. The other reason is that they they're they're two uh, founding graders came over from Beckett and were two of the top graders from Beckett grading services. So they have the, they have the experience uh, in terms of grading card to me, the, the most, um, there, there's two really important things within grading that, uh, that is overlooked by the general hobby. I feel one of them is just, uh, and almost the most important for, for certain cards, especially is authentication mm -hmm. and, and, and identification as well. And I, I had a tour of the PSA office back in 2009. So I'm sure it's grown since then, but I got to see their uh, their reference material room, their 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 library of information and it was like several shelves, bookshelves like, you know, tall ones filled with reference materials. And that really impressed me and to this day it impresses me because I don't know, you know, if you're just starting a grading company a lot of that stuff's out of print now. How are you going to how are you going to gather the information you need to grade, you know, just to pull out something we'll talk about later, but this 1965 Dutch set John Lennon card, right? Yeah. If you're starting up a set, uh, sorry, if you're starting up a grading company now, how are you going to identify all these cards um, and authenticate them? So, yeah. So when you when CSG brought over uh, the two guys from Beckett, I think that that established some credibility uh, with with me at least. Um, so now you know you have to decide for yourself if you like their slab, if you like their label, and this and that. But and their their turnaround times and their prices. Have you said that, like did it was it enough for you to send cards to them? I haven't sent out any cards since <laughs> last year. No, but I, I haven't sent out any cards since last year, right? Yeah. But I also am. I'm also waiting to see how the market responds because that's well, that's very, right. very important. Right. But I do think that when you compare them to the other new, uh, the upstarts, the of the grading companies that are that are just trying to launch, and it does yeah. feel like there's a new one. I just heard of another new one uh, a couple of days ago. It does feel like there's a new one popping up. I'm not going to say every week, but every yeah. month or six weeks, there's another company that's that's. Uh, that saw an opportunity six or 12 or 18 months ago, and they're finally able to launch. And yeah. so, um, well, what, but, what was, what's the one from a couple of months ago? It's called overtime. Oh, it's a, it's up. It's, yeah. I had yeah. that. 
Yeah. Yeah. They've got a special technology uh, that is a little yeah. bit different. Yeah. I mean, like you, like the qualifier that you have there that of, of all the new ones, are they the one, I mean, maybe only because of the, the capital and the experience and, and, um, but I, I just, I don't, I, I don't believe that, that any grading company is going to be able to have, take meaningful share uh, from PSA other than if BGS or SGC got their shit together or, or you know, it, and, and was able to scale. I just think that, I think the brand is too valuable um, and, and, you know, the value that like, and, and just the, the Delta, even with SGC and, and Beckett or the Delta of how much more valuable cards are in a PSA slab, Right. I mean, I don't care, you know, who's grading uh, what, like, I don't want my cards in, in, in a slab of, of anyone besides those three. And even those three, right. It's, you know, I'd still much rather have a PSA just because the, of the value. And I want, and I want the, like, it's little things. I want all the cards to stack together. I want, yes. I want them all to stack neatly together. And if I have a card from, from uh, what's it called HGA or whatever, like, then I have to have a whole stack of cards. This like, <laughs> So yeah. I, I don't know, but, and, and this is why I think that, um, you know, the infrastructure of the industry is, is, uh, will drive a lot of this because I don't think we're going to see it, um, in grading, because even if you have these companies that are well capitalized and, and was it Blackstone that just bought, C, um, I, I, I always get it. To, it's C, CCG. Yeah. They don't CSG. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Um, right. Uh, I, I just don't think it matters, right? I don't think the, the brand matters. I do think it'd be interesting, and and this is completely, I have no knowledge whatsoever, but like, but what if Tops created a grading company? Do you think like the brand of of Tops could could pierce the the the, the slab value that, that PSA and BGS have? Well, I mean, would, would it would come down to would they, would this be an independently run company that would also slab Panini and Upper Deck cards or would they only slab... If they're only gonna, I mean, if they're only gonna ta slab tops cards, then no, because like you said, people like uniformity. Yeah. Um, it, it to me, if if people are gonna listen to what I'm saying, it's gonna come down to who are the graders. That's really important to me. And what is the, you know, tops? I would feel confident could identify and authenticate any tops card that's ever been printed because they might have they might have references, uh, you know, in their archives. Exemplars, but, but uh, all of that, all, all of that are, are known. They're known quantities, right? Like, yes, you have to actually do it. You have to hire the right people. You have to build the right capability. You have to build the right infrastructure to do that. But it, it's a, it's a black and white thing. Like, can you, you know, can can you build the expertise to grade? And the answer is anybody that has any any person, any company that has the, enough resources, money, and time uh, can do that. Um, the question is like the brand value of that slab. And for me, somebody, a new, a new grader, um, any of these, it would just take so much time to build brand equity in, in HGA's name or, but like, and that's why it's like, you just got to assume that, that what happens behind the scenes, um, it works. And you have a, I think a more, uh, probably a, 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 a more, detailed view and are looking much more right than, than your average consumer that's just asking the question of hey what company do i want to grade this and what what slab do i want to own and so i don't know i've just always thought that that just because of the the value in, in the brand of tops or possibly panini or upper deck or or um i don't know i don't know what other what other company might be able to do so. right right back like yeah. beck had already did it like that yeah. that's why like it, what the irony is that you know even though uh bgs is well we can say whatever you want about bgs as a as a company and, and as a competitor psa um the beckett name has been around for so long and it's so valuable and so powerful like that's to me what what drives it and why they're able to do that so yeah, yeah. well you know to answer your question on tops again I th my answer would be yes. I think that they would be successful because of the marketing, simply marketing right. and brand right. recognition, and the fact that a lot of new people in the hobby would just assume that 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 they're good. They don't. They're not right. going to be like right. myself. Right. They're not going to look through to see who's grading these cards, like right. myself and other hobby veterans are going to do. So right. yeah, they're they probably would be successful and could build up a, a team over time, and then maybe even challenge some of the incumbents on skill and and uh expertise right, right. you know because by, by the way you can like for the you hire them hire hire the way the best people right like there, there's a dollar 
that yeah. the top grader at PSA is going to walk out the door at PSA. Like there's, there's a number, yeah. right? And it's yeah. just a question of who's willing to pay it. So, you know, you said before that, uh, you know, for yourself, you're not going to get a card graded with like the HGAs and we use them because they seem to be the biggest name of all these uh, new companies mm -hmm. aside from CSG. Uh, but you want your cards to stack. Well, wouldn't a great move be to make your slab stack with PSA if totally. you're a new grading company? Totally. That like that that's exactly what I would do. I, I would make I would make my slab as close as possible to PSA from a look and feel and, and stackability. That's would be like literally the number one thing that I would I would care about just because I, I think that you don't want to mess with like how people store their their cards. Yeah, I guess un unless somehow uh, PSA has some IP on the, the 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 shape of the ridge that goes in or something, but if you change, I can't see it, right? You change, no. maybe, maybe not, but you change one thing on that slab, you let you make it stack with a PSA slab, you might be totally. pretty good. A lot of people would would uh, would be happy about that. So, so I mean, you know. <sighs> I kind of wanted to talk, like as far as the grading companies goes, we, I think we've hammered it pretty good here, but just to make sure we, we put a bow on it, any sort of like strengths or weaknesses of the current state of them that you, that you can see aside from a brand like Tops coming out with their own grading company, like, do you, let me, let me just, let me back up. With all these new companies coming, I wonder if you agree with me on this, Josh, because I've been saying I've been saying out loud in different forums lately that, you know, if we've got 10 or 15 new grading companies, I think it's a good thing. It's almost like the more the better because they're all going to compete for this little bit of the of the market share. And the cream of those of that crop will rise to the top. And I don't think they're going to like you. I don't think they're going to be able to challenge PSA and Beckett uh, SGC may become under it's there's rumors out there that that the the that uh, the nat turner group is about to acquire this the sgc brand anyway so if these rumors are true and it, right. i'm starting to think they are um that might not matter anyway but you know if the cream of the crop of these x of these second third level grading companies uh does win out that battle uh, do, do you think, do you think there's something to that where, where we might see like out of these 15 companies, how many are going to actually last over five years? Well, the, the interesting variable there, um, and, and sort of what's, what's built into the premise of that question, when you say last five years is, um, is what are those companies, what are their goals of those companies? Because there's no question that, um, any grading company that, knows what they're doing that is well funded right now could build a profitable business you don't have to actually take meaningful share from psa to build a profitable business because there's so much there's so much market out there right even with psa even if they weren't shut down right now right they still can only grade so much so quickly and so it like just uh, we keep using hga i actually have no idea what their volumes are but I do know that, um, you know, uh, up until very recently, um, you know, the uh, SGC, for example, um, you know, wasn't doing more than a couple thousand a day. Um, a couple thousand a day can build a very profitable business. If you think about particularly given where the price of cards is right now and a couple thousand a day wouldn't scratch the surface of taking share away from PSA, particularly because you a lot of that stuff is going to be stuff that people wouldn't be sending the PSA for whatever reason. So I just I just think there's so much out there. And so, I don't know, I, I think you probably, to your point, end up with this second tier of grading companies that exist. And honestly, I don't like it as a collector because every card that goes into an HGA slab, that goes into a, a CGC slab or whatever it is, or, or overtime, to me is, is one less card that I might wanna buy because when I'm looking to buy cards for myself, um like i'm just i mean it, it would have to be a it would have to be a one of one it would have to be something that I, I i absolutely wanted that particular card and there was no other or something that rare otherwise i'm gonna go and try to find it in a bgs or an sgc or a psa slab and and it, it's probably out there so i don't like it as a collector but i do think that there's a there are proper businesses to be made by the way there like someone told me once and i don't know if this is the right number that there were 130 different grading companies that have existed over um whatever it is the past 20 years somebody you know and and 
whether that's the exact number or it's something close, like I believe it. You've seen a lot of these other ones, right? Like GMA and uh, a I mean, a. Yeah, yeah, like they're all out there. Yeah. And yeah. you know, and some of those still exist, right? And so I, I think that you might get one of those guys that that comes back and, and creates some some value there. So I don't know. There there was a slab that I saw called ISA. I don't know if you're familiar with, with that, but the ISA slab. Uh, I thought it was a pretty good looking slab. It's kind of like a combination of PSA and SGC. It's got a black insert and it's kind of the size of, of PSA. So like, I just think you're going to end up with, with a bunch in there and these guys can make a profitable business without having to, to really compete with PSA. Yeah, I, I, I can, I can definitely, I can see that. I can see there being room, especially at some of the regional ones too. You know, the, I, I can see, I, right. can see, I can see that that being a, a bit of an advantage. Or, or by the way, can you see? I could see like um, uh, local ones coming up in, in other countries. Like I could see one just coming up in China to dominate China, or in Japan to dominate Japan. Like that actually seems like a pretty that that's actually a really good idea. Actually, just thinking about it right now, kind of like real time. If you were going to go after a market. Go after a market outside the U.S. that has a big like like Japan, where you have a lot of grading, right? Or excuse me, a lot of gaming. Yeah, you know, even like I'm in Canada, as as, I've, as you know, and you know, Canada is like the size of California population wise. We're about a tenth the size of the United States, and we've got uh, no less than three grading companies here. And I think they're all, especially with cross border business, they're all trying to to grab a piece of of the pie. But there, you know, we also have PSA Canada, which is a a dealership for PSA and they, they do a good business too. So it's uh, there's battles going on. <laughs> there are certainly battles going on. I want to go to a couple comments here, Josh uh, pick four guy says the grading industry needs to get their act together. Newbies might leave the hobby due to frustration of time. It's taking to get cards back. I hear that pick four, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a temporary thing, but I agree with you. There is a time, there is a time limit on, before people, some people do get frustrated. Uh, good evening, Smallville, great to have you. Yam says, it seems that CSG has had some growing pains and backlog similar to what SGC faced last year. And that might be because people like and trust them, which I could definitely see. Uh, Sanderson says, we saw the grading company explosion in the 90s and they all failed. Well, Beckett's still there, PSA is still there. Uh, SGC is still there. They've all been around since the '90s, but the other ones, yeah, they several of them did go away, as, as Josh was just uh, was just letting us know about. And uh, oh, and this is the one I like here from Troy because it. Well, I like it because I agree. He says too many grading companies. Three years from now, they will be a memory, and I agree. The cream will rise to the top. However, regionals might outlast. You know, different countries, as Josh was saying, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, now, uh, before I bring up the next comment, Josh which is from my buddy Slipka, who will be, uh, who him and I will be going for White Castle in Chicago at the end of the month. Um, actually, I'm just going to bring it up. He says, I don't agree with Josh. The value of a card appearance has never meant more. And what HGA is doing is very appealing to new collectors. Multiple new companies will survive, some won't. So the first part of that about, you know, what HGA is doing with their customized label is very appealing to, and the key word here to me is to new collectors because I'm, right. I'm an old collector and it it doesn't appeal to me. I have, I, you know, I wish HGA well. And me I neither. Think, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's, it, it's really, it's not that he disagrees with you. You just have different different tastes. Right. Well, but but his point on new collectors is right. And whether it's it's the appealing of the, the label and what it looks like, but it's just that, hey, look, I just want to have these cards slabbed and uh, I'm a new collector, um, and so I don't I don't necessarily have the tie to to PSA or BGS because I don't already have stacks of those cards. And so uh, you know maybe you know it, whether it's the time, whether it's just the the convenience, whether whether it, it's the the experience on the website of just how easy it is to go and and like you know I mean probably more so than anything. That's why StockX has become what it is, just because it, it's very easy to buy and sell, um, you know, on the site. So look, that that may be true. I, I just don't think you're going to move the the core of the hobby that way. You know, and I want I want to I want to make a point to to Slipka's comment there uh, that Chris McGill said last night on on crossover. And I think this is a, a really astute point. It's one of these things where I was thinking it, but I didn't know how to articulate it. And as he often does, he did it so well when he said that he basically said, I think that the focus of the, of the focus should be on the card, not the holder. And 
I'm a guy that loves cards. I do like my card to present well, and a holder can definitely uh, complement that. But do you want to take the eyes away from the card up to the label where you're going to appreciate the nice art, art and colors? Or do you want to just get your information on the label? And as Nat said on, on, the, on my show uh, last month, he said it's a, it's a very professional looking label. It just gives you the information and then you're back on the card. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think this is one of these things where I agree with, with both sentiments. I, for me, it's as Chris and you are saying, let's look at the card. As Slipka is pointing out, which is a marketplace uh, observation or in, intuition, is that, yeah, some people are going to like and some people do love it. They love the color match and all that. So it's just a, a matter yeah. of preference, I think, at that point. Yeah. We'll do, yeah. Go cool. jump in. No, no, I, I agree with you. I, I agree with you. There's the, the one thing I will say about PSA is I, I never understood why the grade isn't made more prominent. Like, why do I have to find the like the end of the third row to find the, the the grade, right? Like, that's the one thing that you care the most about because presumably you know what what card that is. Um, the one thing that's actually unique about about a, a slab is the grade, and the rest of the PSA label made sense and it's professional, and and people have just you know over time you you grow to you know the familiarity of it. But I always did find it weird that the the grade is just happens to be at the end of the third row and it's not you know, not more prominent. Yeah. Yeah. Another, another comment from Slipka here, just saying that, you know, tops couldn't grade because of the perceived bias for their own cards against others, which I, you know, perceive and the key word there is perceived just like with the goal, with the, the collector's holdings acquisition of golden that already owns PSA. It's a perceived conflict of interest, but one that I'm not dis- I'm not uncomfortable with personally at all. But he says, you can't grade your own either. And your competitors. I'm not either because I don't think there's necessarily, um, look, maybe it's, it's me, maybe other people think differently. I don't think there's uh, there's any more value to tops to have more nines uh, than, than a eight versus a, a panini, right? Um, particularly if you are grading everything, I think you have to grade everything and go down that path. It just, um, I, I just think it, it would it would make things a lot easier if, um, there, like there, well, I don't want to go into all the, the details of it. I just think there's a lot of nuance to it that would make the efficiencies of those better. But more so than anything, it's just as a brand, I would just feel I would feel good about having a, a top slab or, or even a panini slab, which obviously doesn't have nearly the history of tops, right? Which is, you know, difference of um, of 70 years. But I could see if it were to become somewhat of a standard where all the card companies had their own grading department that the hobby grew to trust, you know, perhaps. But that that's that's a it's an interesting thought experiment. We'll we'll leave it at that for now. But what, uh, what, what, what if they what if they combined and said, hey, we're going to you know, we do uh, we, we do our own uh, cards, but we have a joint venture that's a top the upper deck joint venture. And we have our own grading company that does that. And I don't know, you'd have to have probably a different name. Um, Right. Again, to me, it's just, I'm just like looking for, I'm making stuff up here, but like, how do you create value in a brand name that could compete with PSA on grading? And and I just don't know if there's just not a company in the hobby other than tops that has that cachet. Yeah. And I just want to make a comment because what you're doing is you're brainstorming right now. You're not Mm -hmm. saying this will work or this is the solution You're brainstorming and brainstorming leads to ideas, but they, they take time to evolve. So I, I appreciate that you're even throwing it out there because as you're seeing some of it is, you know, I don't controversial is too strong a word because we are just talking, but some of it, you know, you're going to, you're going to have a a differing opinion. Uh, Darcy says, uh, Hey, Darcy, a little late to the show, but that grading machine, the card porn posted, is that legit? Yes, that is legit. It's called card score. And it's a crowdsourcing grading uh, mechanism. Uh, more on that in the future for sure, because that is uh, that is something that's gonna I, I think is gonna have a place in the hobby one way or another. So uh, wait, Trump, so so what is this? This is a because I, a, I it's card a porn is card it's porn a, is the only uh, uh, site that I only only account that I block in the whole hobby. Um, <laughs> okay, well. It's yeah. and card porn just shared it on their on their uh, on their account on Instagram today or yesterday. But basically, I've heard of it elsewhere. It's a company is called Card Score. They have these kiosks with a scanner on it and whatever other mechanism. And you take your card and you scan it into this kiosk and Card Score sends those images out, whether raw or graded. Card Score sends those images out to its hundreds of independent 
graders in the hobby and has them assess the condition of that card based on those images. And they then take that data and they give you the crowdsourced score of your card. Again, graded or ungraded. So I've got lots of thoughts on this um, and I'd be happy to share them, but I it's a little bit off topic. I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, we can come back to it. I, I want to say this is the first I've heard about it, but um, I like it. I, I don't I don't know if that if it replaces PSA or competes with it or anything like that. But like my initial reaction is is I like the idea of it. I like the idea of crowdsourcing um, something that is because again, like, like grading is a known quantity, right? I can it's it's hard and and it's and it's very specific and it's and it's very uh, nuanced in some cases. But it it's it's a known thing. Like it, it is a it is is this is this corner perfect? Is it not? Like what are the like the you know, so um crowdsourcing is is interesting right okay you know, so I'm i will share i will share my 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 initial thoughts so the caveat to what i'm about to say is that they figure out and they plug all the holes for wrongdoing i.e you they spit out a grade of seven and you put it on a card that wasn't the seven as long as they have that covered off by some sort of um identification or fingerprinting technology on the card that was scanned in as long as they are, they have that figured out, which I think they must have something, but I don't know. Then I like the idea, and I would buy. I would buy into it. I would buy a card that was say graded a PSA six, but got a card score of I don't know six point eight, six point nine, seven, or, or higher, and maybe even pay a premium for it. And here's why: it's not because it's not because I I think that the card is in a better technical condition than that PSA 6. But I want everyone to think back. If you if you look at any and I'm going to bring I'm going to use it because PWCC does a good job in their auction descriptions of saying when a card looks better than the technical grade. Yeah. So you can have a PSA 1 that is perfect in all senses but it has a pinhole through it. Yeah. That you can't even really see. Is that card closer to a PSA 1 or closer to a PSA, I don't know, say 6? Now, I know technically it's a PSA 1. There's no way around that. But what is really important here, and what I'm trying to get at is flaws in cards that are only seen under infrared or x-ray machines, like we saw in the video from the C, uh, SGC tour or the equipment that PSA has to really look for the finest, the most the flaws that we cannot see with our with our bare eyes. Right. If you can't see something with your bare eyes, but what you can't see would technically bring it down from a six to a one or a six to a two, do you care? Right. Does it really, really matter? Because you can't even detect that flaw. So for me, eye appeal is very, very important. Maybe the most, and eye appeal is not just centering, maybe the most important subgrade or attribute of a card. So if, the gen if hundreds of, of independent assessors, graders, and I say that in quotes, all on, on consensus or on average deem a card's condition to be better than the technical grade assigned to it, to me that speaks to eye appeal. And it also yeah. speaks to the fact that you can't see these flaws. So if you can't well, see them, why do you care? Well, so you, you hit on something that I would assume – and again, I just learned about this from from you telling me, but I would assume that um, whatever camera technology they're using, you can actually see everything. That it, it's so high res and it's so you know microscopic that you can see every fine point of everything. Which is, uh, I mean, which by the way, it sounds like a pretty smart way to do that. That if you could take you know and send those images at the the most the highest resolution possible to as many people as possible and get a get a grade you know you, you probably end up by the way I, I agree with you a thousand percent one of my most favorite cards that i have is um is a ty cobb that's a two that looks like a nine because it has a pinhole on it and it's, it's amazing um but the um i and i would assume that uh you can't you can't slab it yourself like the the ultimate the, the end product here would be hey yeah. you put your card in here it's either giving you the information that you can do whatever you want with it, right? Which 
and this was the idea, um, I, I think, around some of the stuff with Genement early on, which is, hey, now I know that this card is probably going to be a nine. So now I'm more likely to send it in because I'm not a grader. So I can't tell that maybe it's a six and I don't want to send it. I'm going to get a six, right? That's that's super valuable information that a lot of people don't have. But the next evolution of that would be, hey, I'm putting it in this kiosk. And by the way, I don't even get it back until it's slabbed. And now yeah, what, no. what comes out is a perfectly slab thing that I don't have the ability to put on something else or, or whatever. So it's yeah. either for your own information, do what you want with it, or it comes out slab. Either way, I just like the the, the innovation here, right? Of, well, of like just trying something different for it. Right? Yeah. So so let me just add some context. You don't you don't get a back slab. You take it home with you. But right, but, you, but eventually, but eventually, that's where where the event, this, this yeah, would evolve. It, yeah. Oh, it could go there. But but the way it is now, my understanding is that what it what it gives you is like a sticker uh, uh, with a with a, a serial number or some sort of code that is specific to it, telling you and, what. And that could be misused. Is. is your point? Yeah. Well, cool. I don't know. I don't know what's. I don't know how they how they've actually figured that piece out. But yep. my my overall point here, really, for me as a collector, is that. I have a lot of PSA threes, fours, fives that I don't care that they're not eights and nines because I think they're beautiful. Yep. And if I think it, if, if if the general hobby feels that a card is under undergraded, which shouldn't really be a word because of the technicalities. And and like right. I said before, if if there's a technical flaw that you can't see that brings down the grade, why do you care? Well, you care because the flaw is there. Even though you can't see it, you still care. I get that. I don't. I don't really. You know. I understand that. But as a collector, if I want to have a card and I want to enjoy looking at it, if there's a flaw I can't see, that shouldn't really offend me. And and for me as a collector, it doesn't. So that's why I think it's an opportunity to find really good deals on on cards that are very strong or strong for the grade. So yeah. anyway, uh, Darce, thanks for introducing that. We spent more time on that than I think we we planned to, but that's okay. And I haven't seen the comments that have come from, come from this, so we'll, we'll see how we, what everybody else thinks about this. So uh, let's just go through a few more comments, uh, Josh, and we'll see where that takes us. All right? Yeah, I think you do. I think you do a great job of of inter, uh, weaving comments into your, to your show. Thanks a lot, man. Did you win any of your cards? No, it's still going, which is not a good thing, oh, right? Which means totally that the price wrong. is going up a lot. <laughs> so there, there's one I'm I'm highly focused on. We'll see uh, how long I go. So. All right. I think I, I don't remember if we got to this, but Troy said, I don't want to stack my PSA. I like to display, which is a, yeah, that, that that's a great take. I mean, that that's a collector right there. Uh, Steve Tingwall says, Josh, I agree with your take on grading companies. Honestly, anyone buying anything outside of PSA, BGS, or SGC is just wasting their time. It's not their time, Steve. Well, it's their time and their money because you're just, the market isn't going to give you the value back, at least not yet. We haven't seen that happen yet. So I, I do agree with, with that. Uh, Rich Frank says, if we hit a strike again, it will cripple the hobby. I think he's talking about baseball, and I think there's something to be, uh, there's some merit. Oh, wow, lots of comments coming up, lots of comments, but lots of merit to that comment, Rich. Steve says, anyone who has been in the marketing, sorry, in the market long enough knows this. It's the newbies that are really creating this other marketing and will not be lasting. I agree. Goes on to say, many, uh, Troy says, many have the same thoughts as Josh. PSA Slabs and Becky give you the highest value. It may be a while before the other to close the money gap a while or or never on a lot of them for sure. Fun Pants says, plus all the vintage cards are already in PSA slabs. True story, true story. Gareth, Gareth says, uh, sorry, the PSA label is classic and the conformity of the labels is king. I, I agree, I agree. Uh, Rich Frank says, Joe Orlando PSA, just say that out loud. I'm not really sure why, unless that's a, a something about Joe. Jordan Riker says, I've been loyal to PSA since entering the hobby, but HGA's visual appeal when done right is hard to deny. I mean, not, not for me. It's not what I'm looking for. I want the focus on my card. I want that simple label. Um, that's just me, though. Uh, but I, yeah. it's not just me. It's me and many others. But Jordan is not alone, you know. Yeah. But it is easy. It's not hard for me to deny. And I don't think it's hard for everybody. But I hear what you're saying, Jordan. And we're all entitled to what we like. Spend your money where you want. That, that, that's all good. Sam Genova, my man, good evening and welcome to the show. <laughs> Josh says, hi, Sam. Uh, okay, I'm going to just do a quick scan here. Pick. Oh, I like this. Pick four. Oh, Brian Gray says, uh, leaf grading. Hmm. Hey, BG. Maybe I'll head that, head that one up for hey. you. <laughs> Pick four says, wanting to know my card is authentic is number one. I'm with you. I feel PSA CSG gives me that assurance based on the coin grading divisions. I think Beckett, you can trust them on yeah. 
you know, and again, no, none of these companies are going to get it 100% of the time. You know, fakers are like fraud, fraudsters can be very good. Counterfeiters can be very good for sure. Mike says, I would trust tops for sure. And leaf too. <laughs> PG says, thank you very much. What's this here? I'm buying stock in the JLGC slab company, Jeremy Lee Grading. <laughs> Thanks, Troy. Much appreciated. Hey, I got some for you. I got, it's already for sale. The shares are already for sale, buddy. They're already for sale. Smallville says, if PSA made changes to their slabs that had I appeal like HGA, how would you feel about it? How would you still use PSA to grade? It's a really good question, actually. Um, really good question. I don't think they would just switch it. They'd probably give you the option, uh, but um, I'd have to think about that one for sure. Okay, Josh, we talked about grading companies as far as company infrastructure. You know, you said that as far as company infrastructure, we're in the second inning, meaning you see lots of innovation, entrepreneurial ventures to come. We talked about the grading companies. Where do you want to go next? Because we still have card companies and marketplaces. You you pick where we go. Uh, well, you can do, let's do card companies quickly. That's the, the I think, the, the quicker topic. So, I mean, this gets into the the counter of Tops being such a, an important brand name because uh, they've been around since 1952, but it's the same business from 1952. And and I know, you know, um, uh, uh, Brian's on uh, here as well. All the trading card companies today still run like CPG companies, right? They design cards, somebody else prints them, somebody else sells them. Uh, most of the products get sold to distributors, they get sold to retailers, get sold to people, they get sold on uh, eBay, they, or get sold on marketplaces. Um, you know, none of these are direct to consumer e-commerce companies. Um, none of them are technology companies. And it's not to their fault. I mean, they, they've they been around for, for a very long time. And frankly, up until, you know, three, four years ago, um, didn't have the, uh, you know, didn't have the, the success that they've been having for the last four years. So they don't necessarily have the, the money and resources to to invest and to, to uh, evolve those companies. But it's very clear that trading cards are not CPG products, um, that they are financial assets, that they should be, you know, uh, run, you know, either the way finance companies are run or the way technology companies are run uh, in the creation of those products. And, um, and, and that's, by the way, it'll change. It'll happen, and I'm sure that all the, the all those companies are are working on that stuff in different ways. Um, but what they've done so far is um, is just is scratching the surface, right? The best example of this is Panini uh, trying to do what they call they call a, a, a Dutch auction. It's actually not a Dutch auction. The the declining auction that they do, um, and I don't want to go down this rabbit hole because this is just a topic that's that's near to to my heart. But the, it's just it, it, like what they've done is um, it's a very very poor experience, and they're not able to quickly iterate on that because they're not technology companies. They don't have 120 engineers the way that StockX does, the way that that other companies that were that were created um, you know in the last five years have. And that's what I mean when we say talk about the infrastructure. Like they will become technology companies. They will become direct to consumer e commerce companies. Um, but we just, that, that doesn't happen overnight. They have a remarkably strong brands and, and now, you know, remarkably strong businesses because of, of how the, the industry has grown. But they have a long way to go in, in terms of what those companies, what, what they should look like. Yeah, no, well, well said. Appreciate those insights. So uh, let's keep that one as quick as it was and let's go to, uh, marketplaces. So, Marketplace. yeah. So the question there is, and I, you know, obviously I say obviously because for me, eBay, and I think for many eBay has been the go-to for many, many years now. It's just, it's a worldwide marketplace, but people have become frustrated with eBay, especially this year. It seems, I mean, you know, a lot of people fondly refer to eBay as fee bay, but I don't know. I mean, you, you got to pay to play, right? You're you not paying pay. rent in a lot of cases if you're if you're you know unless you're an LCS or whatever. But you know they deserve to earn to make something for their for their efforts as well. Totally. And that then, that that is not the problem with eBay. That no, like no, their fees. That that's not the problem. Yeah, it's not the problem. But let's get into what the problems are with the marketplaces and the fact that there's so many more that are now making a push, just like with grading companies. So you know today. We've got we've got so many new mark. We've got you know we've got we've got the Com C. We've got the Star Stock. We've got we've got the eBay. We got the My Slabs. Um, we've got all the even some of these fractionals as well. 
my question for you, are there, are there too many? And what, what do you see as uh, the future with, with these things? How, how would you like to see it? And where do you see improvements coming? Yeah, man, uh, this is a massive topic. Let's start with the fact that um, eBay is the leader um, because eBay has the most cards. Um, and that is a somewhat circular statement um, and it can be uh, circular, but the way that you win at marketplace is with liquidity and uh and you know this is you know uh, marketplace and and the, the the chicken and the egg of buyers and sellers this is the oldest problem in the history of the internet and the hardest problem in the history of the internet right because it's very hard to get buyers if there's no sellers it's very hard to get sellers if there's no buyers and so you can only do it in lockstep a couple here a couple here a couple there um and it's why you know not to kind of like toot our own horn but like the the rapid growth of stock x um why it was um uh, so impressive is because marketplaces you know are, are very hard to to grow um very quickly but for stock x where we um obviously started with sneakers we passed ebay insane shoe sales 11 months into it i mean we we flew by them and uh and never looked back and didn't don't even look at ebay as a competitor anymore we haven't looked at ebay as a competitor um in years and it's because of the model for how sneakers are sold um, is so different than how they're sold on eBay. And the core is using a single product page versus a listing model. And this is this is your like now we're I guess we're in like marketplace 101. But this is the, the fundamental uh, sort of two choices in a marketplace. You have a listing based model, which is eBay, which is anyone can go list whatever they want to list. You have a product-based model, which is StockX, which is you go to StockX and you want to buy a pair of Air Jordan 3 Black Cement. You want to buy a, a Luca 2018 Prism PSA 10. There's one page for that product and everything happens at that one page. You go search for a Jordan 3 Black Cement or a Luca 2018 Prism on eBay, you'll get thousands of listings. That is your, your the two starting points. And you can look at some of these other ones like Starstock, for example. Starstock has a product-based listing. Right model where you go there and you will look for the Luca Doncic 2018 Prism page, right? That um, the but what's interesting is that because StockX added trading cards, you didn't even mention StockX in the your your list of, of marketplace right there, and I'm not the least bit offended, even though uh, we did we do sell cards there because it's not the right it's not the right mousetrap, and neither is eBay. I think it's somewhere between. I think that you need a single product page. And I think some of these companies like Starstock, like Alt, are attempting to try to find where do those things uh, uh, meet in the middle? Because there's not um, there's not a ton of liquidity on any one product in, in cards. With the exception of like, you know, about 10 uh, uh, big Prism cards, Luca 2018 Prism, uh, Trey, Zion, Ja, you know, a handful of these guys that have ma massive pops um, most of them, you don't have more than a couple thousand of any, even, the, even the, the biggest, you know, pop cards. That's not a lot of product out there in the world. So it's, it's a really complicated thing to say, well, what is the right mousetrap? What is the right marketplace that can take down eBay that can create a lot of liquidity? I don't necessarily have the answer here, but I'm, I'm just trying to tee up the, the differences of it. But the reason why, and like, there's a lot of reasons why, um, people don't like eBay, but fundamentally is you're selling it off of a, a listing base, which means that you will miss a card or you will not get the best value for your card. Because if you're selling, if you wanna buy a Luca 2018 Prism PSA 10, which is probably the most populous card that exists in all of cards, right? It is possible that you won't find the one for the best price at that moment that you're buying it. And that sucks. Right. Or the flip side is that you won't um, that someone will list a card that you wanted that'll come and go and you won't know because you didn't search for that card in that seven day period. There's so many things that make it challenging to buy cards when you're using a listing based model. And that is the, the source of all of eBay's problems. It doesn't it's not as simple as just creating a, a listing based um, a product based uh, a market, which is what what StockX is. But like that's the core of it. All marketplaces have fees. All marketplaces have to make money. That's fine. That that's part of it. Um, eBay is so big that you don't get the customer service that you might at somewhere like all. You don't have some of these other services like vaulting. There's a ton of stuff around the edges. But like for everybody thinking about 
what type of marketplace they want to use, just understand the difference between a listing base and a product based and what that means for, for how you buy and sell cards. That's a starting point for think about the evolution of marketplaces in, in trading cards. Wow, man. Wow. <laughs> you're like, you're asked like, you know, I, yeah. I ran a marketplace for this. This is stock X. Stock X is, is, you know, a very popular marketplace. Well, no, that's why that's why I want you to come on to I want I want your insights. Yeah. And, and it, Sorry, and I, I didn't mean to create a, an economics class, but yeah, it's all good because for everybody out there and all all of us in the hobby who have our issues with the current options and they all have their they all have their pain points. Right. It's nice to to hear from you as to what your nirvana is, you know, and you don't even know it, but you well, at least I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure any of us do it. And I think someone will innovate around it. And yeah. you you iterate through exactly what what the customers want. And the customers will eventually tell you, right? And and we did that in StockX for certain products, but you know StockX is not the leader in, in trading cards right now, and that's okay, right? And I, I think you have some smart people out here who are trying to figure it out, and and I think they will. Yeah, but even even the way you you broke it down into those two frameworks of the listing versus the product model, yep. uh, that that's helpful to give people just a a, a, a jumping off point, really. So. Yep. Um, Okay, uh, you know, do you think that, let's say that there was the model that came out that was perfect for trading cards, how, how many different marketplaces would be, a, would be optimal? How many different competitors in that space can you see surviving? And I know it's a tough question, but, yeah. you know, can well, you? Well, usually, usually marketplaces become a winner take all. Um, in very, very big markets, you'll get a duopoly, you'll get Uber and Lyft, you'll get StockX and Go, um, or, or you get marketplaces that will segment by some uh, major access. So maybe it's segmenting by geography. Um, you know, uh, there's actually a company called uh, Do, D-U, which is uh, the largest sneaker marketplace in the world. Actually, it's larger than StockX, but it's just in China. So it, it's segmented geographically. Um, I think what may happen in cards, I think we may end up with two marketplaces, one for wax and one for singles. That's like my gut, just given that they, they're, they're fundamentally very, very different in how they are bought and sold and, and the liquidity, um, how like, you know, you have to obviously have a, um, cards graded to be standardized, but most wax, um, it's, it's just simpler. There's fewer products. I don't go in deep, but like, so like my gut is like long term and I, I, not even long term, medium term, we end up with um, either eBay remains the king or you have, I think, two marketplaces, one that wins for wax and one that wins for uh, because I, I think they're, they're going to have to fig figure them out a little bit differently. Right. You're going to have to have something. And I think if they do that right, uh, the focus um, will be the the reason they win. And so you'll, you'll have two different like that. That's my gut. But. You know, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I, there's not one I'd bet on right now, given where they're at. I don't, I don't think that any I've seen like, oh yeah, that's the one that, that's going to win. Right. But that there's a lot my, of people trying to figure it out. Yeah. That was my next question of, of the, of all the marketplaces that we currently have. Do you see one of them um, evolving or morphing into, into one of these two, two ultimate champs, if you will? I think you answered that. So I don't, can... I don't, I, I am curious to see um, the evolution of PSA and Golden. Um, because I, uh, it's obvious, it's pretty clear that, that, um, I mean, if I was, if I was PSA, I, I would try to build a marketplace. Like they, they control all liquidity for they don't all, but they control the largest liquidity of graded cards at one place at one time, more so than anyone else. And again, like you win marketplaces with liquidity. Um, and so if I was PSA, I would be thinking about, how do I create a marketplace for graded cards? By the way, if I was BBCE, uh, I might be thinking about how do I build a marketplace for wax? Okay, last question on this is in this ultimate format of marketplace, do the cards, the singles, pass through a central location or is it or is it uh, C to C, is it user to user? So, you know, instead of me shipping my card yeah. on eBay like I do to you, does more of the stock X model is it going to go through a, a, a central, um, uh, you know, authenticator type of thing, or um, I always forget the S like an escrow service type of thing. Yeah. Even. Yeah. Well, you're, you're hitting on, uh, you know, and this is why marketplaces are complicated. I, I laid out the, 
the starting two axes, which are, are product based or listing based, but the next is is intermediated or not intermediated, right? Um, and eBay is is not intermediated, and the product goes directly from the buyer to the seller, right? Um, StockX is intermediated; it goes from the seller to StockX to the buyer, and because of that, the buyer and seller never talk. They never, you never know who's on the other side of that transaction. And I won't go into all the details, but there's a lot of pros and a lot of cons to that. Um, I do believe that the, that the ultimate marketplace will be an intermediate marketplace. I think that you can just control the customer experience so much better. You can create uh, and help with liquidity um, so much better by, by doing that. So I, I do think that ultimately um, it is a intermediate marketplace that, that will win. Okay, man. I love it. This is a great discussion. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to spend a few minutes here on some comments. You check your auctions and, uh, and then we're going to get into uh, the next topic, which is going to be just to keep everyone on the edge of their seat, sort of what you are up to, to the extent that you are able to talk about it. So I do want to bring up uh, Jordan Riker's comment here. Wisdom of the crowd is a real thing statistically. Gareth says, I personally would stop grading with PSA if they started making HGA type labels or if they did a grade over PSA 10, which Nat said they will never do. He also said they'll never bring out a 9.5. Um, Jahan says, I doubt PSA worries about HGA. Yeah, like to me, there, there's no, not no even way. on the radar, not even no. on the radar. I mean, they're aware of them likely, but not, but <laughs> that's it. Uh, Rich Frank says, I like how SGC looks. Yeah, you're not alone. A lot of people do. Jahan says HGA has a smart owner, that's for sure, but time tells the tale. Yeah, smart doesn't necessarily mean you know successful. No, I wish them well. I do. Just do it right. Do it right. Be consistent and get your authenticity and your identification uh, correct. Uh, Tiger Jordan says, why would a card manufacturer want to be in the grading business where they would be showcasing the conditions of their own cards uh, when they're inconsistent or flawed? Yeah, that's a good point. I do think that you know cards have never come out of the pack in mint condition, but it's a it's a it's a it's a collector um, kind of demand that we have, and it's just not the case. Uh, Jahan says collectors are risk averse by nature, mostly. Fair enough. Colin says some monster cards selling for good prices on the memory lane auction closing tonight. Darno said, yeah, I, I I have I am in on one. I was high bidder before, but I'll just wait and see if it if it remains that way. Rich Frank says that HGA is gimmicky. We have an agreement. Jordan says the crowdsourced grading addresses that my grader was having a bad day. Yeah, you know, the more people that looking that are looking, it's like it's like you get the the larger the sample size, the smaller the standard deviation. So it uh, it does make sense to me as well. Logan says those are there are hairline creases that high res scanners cannot see. So this is to the fact to to what Josh you said that you know do these scanners at the card score kiosk can they see all the flaws and I forgot to mention back then, but from what I saw, because um, he someone goes on to say here, Rock Rock Latex says card score uses an Epson V600. I've got the Epson V550 right here. Uh, he says they don't pick up surface issues. So that being the case, and that was that was my assumption and understanding that that you're not going to see all these technical flaws. So just back to that discussion. Pick four says, did they have this technology in 2000? Maybe a newly graded PSA it would be a PSA 10 20 years ago. Who knows? Logan says, I appeal and centering are my top two criteria for graded cards. I think that's uh, a common position. I know for me, it's I appeal. See, to me, it's it's focus, especially on a vintage card. I want those printing plates to have been lined up perfectly with very little um, uh, blur, if you will. Rich doesn't care about centering at all. Says it's a printer condition. Yeah, but printer issues are issues still. They're not a, they're not a, they're not a, uh, they are to me, Rich, they are condition issues, but they're condition issues that came at the printing facility versus being handled. I still consider it, a, uh, for me anyway, a condition issue. Okay, uh, boy, oh boy, thanks guys. Very, very active in the chat. I know, I feel like it's been a great conversation so far. Uh, do, we'll do a couple more. Triple V says, why did eBay remove ERA from the search criteria? Really frustrating. I, you know, you can still search by sport. I don't know what you mean by, oh, era, era, sorry. Yeah. Era, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that could be fun, especially if that was something that you used a lot, no doubt, no doubt. Um, everyone wants a piece of the pie for sure. Yeah, I agree, Troy. That was a really great explanation of the two different marketplace platforms, and thank you, Josh, for that. 
Trigger says, is there a place in the hobby for an online platform that simply allows trades only for a small monthly membership fee? Yeah, I've thought about that before, and I don't I don't believe there is. We talked about the pit earlier, Rock Latex. That has come up. Josh raised that earlier on. And, okay, we're getting close to the bottom of the, of the comments here. Uh, Mike says, I list my cards in about five marketplaces and most recently have been able to list cards on Post uh, Poshmark, which is – I haven't heard of that one, which is pretty much an, only a clothing market. You're familiar with it, Josh? Yeah, yeah, it's like a luxury. It, it's it's usually focuses on on like women's luxury luxury clothes. Thank you. And here's one. Here's one for you. Your thoughts, Josh, on the high buy sell fees on the auction houses versus the smaller fees on eBay. It shocks him uh, that they host they host so many sales. Doesn't eBay have more eyeballs than Golden and Heritage? So, well, what do you think about these twenty percent buyer and seller premiums? Well, look if you. If you switch the model and you move the the fee to the to the buyer, um, the card will the card will sell, um, and Golden doesn't care what the if it sells for less, um, and the buyer should uh, should include that the the premium in in what they're going to pay for it. Um, and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't, but if you have very rare cards, then, um, a lot of times that there's not a, it's not a market price on that stuff anyway. Um, and so it's just a good model for, for high end stuff because what they're trying to get is sellers to list on golden rather than selling it on eBay. And it's great for the seller, right? The seller pays no fees, you know, in a lot of cases in sometimes, uh, golden would actually give part of the buyer fee to the seller. So, you know, some sellers, or if you, you know, if you have a really big card, uh, sometimes, you know, Golden will give you 110% of the sales price. So, um, you know, it's just, it's just a, a different market, but um, there's a lot of reasons of, of why uh, if you're a seller, you might more likely to sell on, on a high-end platform. So. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. Uh, Slipka with uh, breaking news, Acuna torn ACL out for the season. Right. And uh, Footloose jumps in with Acuna Matata. Yeah, that's <laughs> pretty funny. And Brian Gray is now looking to buy them because he'll feel that they'll be at a discount. And, you know, to me, I sm- you know, you, you, smell a, you smell a buying opportunity, perhaps. That's the way that that's just the way our, our hobby works. People uh, very sure. much what have you done for me lately. And Bobby Burrell makes a really good point here. He says, those who take the time to search, reap the rewards, and as flawed as eBay is, it's a treasure trove of, trove of deals due to listing shortcomings. And I wonder how much eBay takes that psychology into, into account when they're looking at, at their at their processes and their their you know their 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 platform to, you know, is that a is that a known benefit to them? Because some people do you know they will on purpose josh they will on purpose in a search spell a player's name wrong by mixing up two letters to see if anyone else did that i wonder if yeah. that's something that, that they well, consider. It, it's not about ebay um that's not the part that they uh that they value but the reason why um ebay is as valuable as it is is because you can find anything and the flip side of having a, a listing base versus a product base as a marketplace they don't have to to, to curate what goes on the site. So at StockX, you can't sell something on StockX unless we create the product page that enables you to then go sell it. So there's work and time that goes on there. But you can sell anything you want on eBay anytime. By definition, there's just going to be more products that are there. There's going to be more things. And by the way, if you're a buyer and you want to find some rare vintage, you know, uh, I don't know, Led Zeppelin t-shirt from 19, you know, 78, like eBay is going to be your best bet because it, like anything could be there. So there's yeah. so much value in that model. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's good for, for other products and it creates inefficiencies in other places. But like that's the value of having a listing base is that anyone can sell whatever they want whenever they want. And there's obviously a lot of value in that. Yeah, for sure. It's like the garage sale sort of, which it, which was, I oh, believe, yeah. it was really a, a, originally sort of meant to be. Oh, okay. okay. Colin Murray, good evening. Great to see you, buddy. Uh, and then I want to bring up uh, Brian Gray says, I have a thousand plus Acuna updates. Uh, yeah. And Mike Wick makes the very astute comment. Time to make that 2000, Brian. I, I think I'm sure you're probably going to be looking over the next few days on that. 
Uh, Smallville with a comment. I haven't read it. Let's see. He says, how do you feel about tops not making the other sports anymore? Would you like them and upper deck to get back into those sports? And would you like Panini to make them? Yeah, I, I'd like to see tops and Panini make hockey cards uh, just selfishly because I like some, some of the products that those companies do. I'd also like to see Leaf get a license. I'd like to see more. I, they all bring something great to the table and do some great things. So yeah, yes, I definitely would. BG, don't cry too hard. You're you're just gonna have to add a year to your uh, to your exit strategy. That's it to the horizon. You'll get there. You'll get there. Okay, Josh. Let's move on to another topic because we're already at the hour and a half mark, and we're gonna do about 20, 25 more minutes. So, you've left your role as CEO at StockX. There's decades of business left ahead for it. So you obviously have something in the back of your mind. I mean, you're young, dude. Guys like you don't just retire at 40, 41 years old. I don't think you'll make that call for yourself, but lots of time ahead for StockX. Um, and you're in, but I do know you are endeavoring into the hobby from a commercial standpoint. You must be really excited about it to do that, to leave StockX, your baby, to come into the hobby. What I know you, I know because we talked, you're not going to tell us what you're, because someone might steal it, right? <laughs> No, it's it, uh, it's funny because uh, by my own rationale, I should I should tell you no that that this is this is the flip side of it. The reason to not say what's going on uh, is because I don't want to to um, you don't want to give up the the PR value of creating a moment when you launch a company like that. It's 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 literally as simple as that from the, the marketing and PR value of doing that all in a coordinated effort at at, at the right time. Um, it's not at all about about someone stealing the business, and in fact. You know, um, we've I've had to, to hire people and, and raise money and, and uh, create business partners and create business deals. So there's a ton of people out there that that know about the business. It's not about um, hiding it. But from a public standpoint, you know, it just unfortunately, you don't talk about that until it's the right time to launch, which, you know, knock on wood, like if the time goes right, just, it's probably October. Um, it's probably when, when we launched the new business. Um, there's uh, there's 11 people. We live in seven different cities, which is the, the unique uh, thing about creating a business in a post-COVID world. Um, and what sucks is like, cause I love the, the headquarters of it. I love the office. Like I spent so much of my time at StockX, you know, designing and thinking about like what the physical space looks like where everyone, everyone works. Um, and, um, and so, you know, I don't know if we'll, we'll ever have that again, but um yeah, uh, I certainly can't talk about that part, but what I, what I can talk about is um, uh, is I, I created a, a business that is um, like a, uh, it's like a financial services company for trading cards. It's literally, I mean, we, we created a fund for cards, but it's the it's the, the, the financial services thing where you could create more funds, you could create other financial products. Um, I was saying for the longest time to people, you know, eventually, uh, you know, Vanguard is going to have trading card mutual funds. And then I was like, hold on. I was like, well, why don't we just create trading card mutual funds? Why don't we create the, the Vanguard of trading cards? And um, it was less about the, the the business opportunity than it was everybody was asking me for help buying cards. Um, what happened was, and I'm sure you get this too as well, as you have all these new people coming in, people ask for help, you know, buying cards. And uh, it what started as a little bit of advice, and then someone says, "Hey, can I give you, you know, can I give you ten grand? Can I give you fifty grand? Can you buy me a, a mini collection?" Um, and I did that for about a half a dozen friends as friends, and then those conversations start going, "Hey, can I give you fifty grand and buy me a collection?" But you know, I don't really want to hold it. Could you like hold it for me and then and then help me sell it later? And I was like, "No, no, like no." And I was like, "Hold on," I was like. There's actually a very like obvious business there. And from the moment that I got back in the hobby in like in, in late 2018, um, every smart person that, that this conversation came up in, everyone said, well, of course there should be trading card funds, of course. Um, and so, and we're not the only one that, that's done this, um, but it was a very just like natural evolution of People want to buy cards. People wanted to treat them as investments. People don't want to, didn't want to, to hold them. And like, this is also, you know, you mentioned fractional. We haven't talked about it. The fractional companies, it's the same thing. It's just a different, it's, a, it's, a, it's the inverse of it. It's, hey, I want to buy a piece of this one card as opposed to I want to buy, uh, you know, a piece of, of many cards. It, it's literally the, the exact same thing from an investment standpoint. Uh, it's just about, you know, which, which one you're buying and which company you're working with. So, um, so that exists. Um, the, the name of the company is called Six Forks Kids Club, 
which is, um, uh, frankly, it, it's, it's kind of just, I always wanted to name a company Six Forks, um, which is literally, that's the only reason. Uh, and then the, the team was like, um, okay, um, so it should be like Six Forks, like uh, capital asset management. I was like, no, get the fire. I was like, no, no, no. It's like, we're not called, no. It's gotta be some completely the opposite of that. I was like, it's not gonna be like asset managers. And, um, and then I was like, you know what? I was like, we all collected cards as kids. You know, we all have kids that collect cards. Did a, it's possible that I'm spending my kids' uh, college tuition on cards. So we're calling this Kids Club. And, uh, and that was the whole story of it. So, so that's a business that exists. We can, we can check back in October when, I, when we can talk about the, uh, the, the other one. But, um, but these are the, the two focuses for me. Honestly, there's actually a third business, which is my own collection, which um, reached a point where uh, I was moving so much money from my own personal investments into trading cards because I believed in, uh, in, in the cards so much that created a separate LLC, created a separate entity, um, and managed that with my wife, almost like a separate business. Um, you know, making sure that we're paying taxes and everything else that, that goes along with, 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 uh, with running a business the right way, um, which is the most fun business of all it's it's buying and selling baseball cards so managing your collection is, is totally really fun yeah for sure totally. for sure uh are you gonna be at the national yeah uh absolutely um absolutely i uh, i'm in the process of of moving as you mentioned in, in opening from detroit to texas um and uh and unfortunately i probably have to bounce out um on uh either friday night or saturday morning but i'll definitely be there until then uh, i'll probably get there either uh, late tuesday night or, or early wednesday morning and what are you going there to do? You just going to walk around? You got some plans? You going yeah. to set up, promote, network? What's the plan? No. So I, I, ironically, this happened to me at the last national. Um, obviously, in, in nineteen, as, as there was nothing last year, which was um, in twenty nineteen, we were launching cards on StockX, but we weren't launching until ironically October. Um, and so we actually had a booth for StockX um, there, but didn't do anything because we hadn't even launched. And so all I was doing was was taking meetings. And so I tried to get them to let me buy a booth again, literally because the booth at StockX was just, it was a booth. It, you couldn't get, it was just a door and you went inside and it was just some couches and some food and we hang out. Uh, and it wasn't open to the public. It was just to take meetings and it was awesome to have this spot in the middle of the floor to just hang out and relax and then go back out and walk so i tried to buy a booth again and they were like man we're sold out and that seems like a silly use of money just to have a place to hang out i was like yeah that's probably true too um so uh i am there purely as a um as a as a consumer um i'm sure i will have a lot of meetings given that everyone in the hobby is there um, but we do not have a booth. We have no marketing activities planned. Um, and, uh, and I'll be there just buying and bu not selling, buying a lot of cards, um, and, uh, and trying to, to come up with my plan right now of what I want to buy. I, I bought, I think I'm done buying Otani. Uh, I bought a ton for a long time because, uh, I, it was so clear of what was going on uh, with him. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what my next, uh, what I want to focus on right there. I think I'm losing this auction, by the way. Um, uh, I'm not. I'm not going any farther. I was trying to buy. Um, it's a Brady 2018 Prism Gold Vinyl, number to five, DGS 9.5. That it was at 17,000. I thought I was going to get it for like 10. So. So you're you're, I'm, you're bowing I'm, out. I'm I'm, I'm bowing out uh, bowing of out, this man. one. So yeah. All right, man. Well, you know what? It's hey, the worst. That's not as bad because you've chosen not to buy that card or not to keep competing with, for the option to pay for it or the right to pay for it. But the worst is when you really want a card and you see that. For me, it's a fifteen-minute notification on my phone that eBay comes up, and then I get distracted and the mm. card is gone, and I'm like, oh, you know, I missed it. But you just got to remember, dude. There's always more cards. There's always more cards. There, there is always more cards. Yeah. You don't use you don't use Bitnapper or any of the the sniper sniper. No, bomb. I'm a I'm a very uh, when I remember I'm a very uh, very skilled manual sniper. Yeah. 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 No, I am too. And honestly, sometimes I like doing it that way. But uh, there's just cards I want. I'm like I, I I I was losing. I was missing too many cards that because I forgot about it. Yeah. And, and like, and you know, at some point I'm like, crap, I just don't want to, I don't want to miss it anymore. And so, yeah, so I'll, I'll use, I use Bidnapper um, when, uh, when there's something that I really want. All right. Colin says, that's so cool. Best of luck with the kids club venture. 
Trigger Finger says, Josh, what advice do you have for people in the hobby after the craziness we've seen in the last 12 to 24 months? Well, um, I guess two things. One, um, I still, I'm still very long on, on all of it. Uh, you know, notwithstanding, um, you know, what we've seen in terms of the crash from February and, and March and, and where cards are going. Um, I'm still very long. Um, but second is, um, you know, I think people need to understand that, that there are natural market inflections and if cards are going to go up really fast at this point, it's happened like four very distinct times in the last, in the last like 18 months where it's like when cards go like this really fast like they're gonna come back down you know at some point and like this is a, a more natural thing which is you know just understand that and understand that it's cycle and, and don't get too caught up in either way i think there's a lot of people right now that are really almost depressed um with with where they are because they came in uh, at the peak and it's a, the flip side don't don't feel don't feel that much better about yourself if you came in on on the the, the valley um, either, but just understand that that it goes up and down, um, and that's just that's just that's just part of the market. That that's great advice there. Just don't panic. I think is the yeah. is really the advice. Be patient is a virtue. I'm gonna do a few more comments. Logan, by the way, wait, wait, wait to like take my rambling. Yes, be be patient. <laughs> don't panic. That, way Summit. better. Way better. Thank you. You bet, you bet, buddy, you bet. Jared, yeah, I'm the analog sniper, that's right. Logan, uh, so Sharpshooter says, uh, you know, Acuna has torn his ACL, and this is exactly why you shouldn't spend thousands of dollars on sports cards. So I'm going to pick this apart because it's a very flawed comment, actually. So there's two reasons why it's flawed. The first one is that sports cards is a very broad term. Uh, I think what Sharpshooter means more is why you shouldn't spend thousands of dollars on active uh, player sports cards. The second thing I I'll pick apart on this, not pick apart sharpshooter, but just, you know, the issue I have with the comment is that it's a very near term outlook you have. Uh, uh, now, if, if Acuna is out permanently, if he's not going to come back and, and get to where he was, then yeah, that's the risk that we take. But if you're diversified, then you, you kind of cover it off to an extent, but you can't be fearful of injury on every card you ever buy. However, I'm I'm with Sharpshoot a little bit in that I have very little exposure to active players. I prefer the the you know either the the icon the legends or you know the goats or or the Hall of Famers or the uh, the guaranteed Hall of Famers, the active guaranteed Hall of Famers. But it's also uh, the the issue I have is that it's a very short term mindset, and for somebody out for season, big deal. What that means is buying opportunity dollar cost average down if he's good if it and i don't know much about acl injuries but if he's going to come back from that and and you know he's still gonna have his skills then it's a it's a buying opportunity and you, you just dollar cost average down so um okay. i don't know i just don't think that's a, that's the best comment sharpshooter that i've seen you have but uh but anyway fair enough and uh yeah mike says they go up and down just like stocks stay, stay the course exactly Exactly. Rich Frank says sharpshooting, missing the mark on that one. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay, Josh, two two more things I want to touch on. We're not going to get through everything I had, but two more things. The first one, when I saw you on the crossover with Chris and Josh a few months ago, you were talking, you, you were getting some help from the crowd to name the new show that you were going to, the hobby content show that you were doing on ESPN. Where is that at? And have you named that show yet? Um, we have not. So, uh, so Kevin Nagandi, who uh, is a Sports Center um, anchor and uh, and a friend, a longtime supporter at uh, StockX, um, you know, asked me to to do a, this pilot uh, YouTube uh, trading card show for ESPN. Uh, I think we did it maybe about seven or eight episodes. Uh, it is currently on uh, on hold. We're waiting for green light. I don't know the, I just show up and, and talk with Kevin. Uh, he manages the, the the bureaucracy at ESPN. So we're, we're somewhat on hold, but we never actually came up with a name. I had the, the name I liked um, was uh, the other side of the pillow uh, because trading cards are cool again, which I thought was like very brilliant, but um, there was just some sensitivity, I, I suppose, fair enough uh, with the, with that being Stuart Scott's line and Stuart Scott has, has passed away. I thought it was, an, it was a nice tribute. So, um, yeah, we, uh, we we still haven't come up with a name, but the show is also on hold right now uh, pending, uh, I don't know, whatever 
ESPN does in, in the meantime. So we'll see. I, but I don't know. Did, did you have any, uh, any have suggestions a, for names? Well, I just have a favorite from all the ones that came out of that discussion uh, that I remember. It was the simplest one of all. It was simply card center. I just think that makes that to me. It's simple and it's easy, you know. The one, the reason I, I like that was it, it's an obvious nod to to Sports Center, and the the thing that I liked was, or I I was angling towards was, is hey, look, if this is ESPN's trading card show, we should take advantage of the ESPN brand, and exactly. and and we should we should people should know. Like I was as one of the options, I was even just saying that it should just be like ESPN cards, you know, or or just just something that people understood that because I thought that was a really great thing for all of us that ESPN cared enough to have a of a trading card show. So we'll see when we get back on the horse and, and, uh, and what we call it, but right now we have neither. So. All right. Last topic, man. Uh, before, before we sign off on the night and just everybody who's uh, in the chat, in the audience, guys, um, if you're new to sports cards, live, welcome to the show. Please hit the subscribe button. If you got here late, I know a bunch of you did. This has been a fantastic discussion. So be sure you can go back and watch all the old episodes are on the YouTube channel. Feel free to check them out, subscribe to the channel, all those things. Um, and afterwards, uh, in about 12 to 15 minutes, we'll be coming back with Frankie Gonzalez, a shop owner in San Juan, Puerto Rico, big Michael Jordan collector. Uh, and that's going to be a, a fun episode as well. So check that out. And of course, every Saturday night, Josh, what, what is exciting you right now in your collection? And this is a, this is a loaded question because I want you to say non-sport. So let's talk about non-sports cards. And I want you to tell the Jimi yeah. Hendrix collection story. Yeah, well, I, I will say um, very quickly before uh, non-sport is um, is just oh, Otani. I mean, uh, like, and you know, from a, a value standpoint, um, I still think there's a ton of value in, in Otani. But I mean, over the last like um, like two months, I've been buying more Otani than anything else. But over the last um, you know probably uh, fourteen months, um, I've been buying a lot, a lot of non-sport cards. Um, I think at the highest level, um, you got to understand that the people um, are as iconic and as important as any athlete ever. When I say the people, I, I mean, when you're buying cards of, uh, of, of rock stars or, um, uh, or politicians or business people uh, or, uh, or artists, um, and there's never really been a regular series of cards um, around that stuff, but there have been a few cards here or there. Um, you know, more recently in 2011, um, uh, Panini had a, a trading card set that had a, a card from Tupac, from Biggie, and, and Snoop in it. In 2009, there's a Kim Kardashian Upper Deck, set, uh, Upper Deck card. There's the Joe Rogan UFC announcer card. There's, um, there's a Kanye West card from 2011. There's a whole bunch of, of Jay-Z cards in 2005 that Topps put into a bunch of Bowman and, and Top sets. That uh, that people are probably aware of of one of the the one of ones that sold at at Golden for eighty some thousand dollars, um, and even the the best example really is is the the Dwayne Johnson the Rock University of Miami football card. Obviously, that's a football card, but it's not because of his college football career. It's because the Rock is the most famous actor in the world. Um, and so for me, uh, I've been buying a lot of uh, of all that stuff, including I think that Kim Kardashian card is. Um, I think that's a, a fifty thousand dollar card at, at some point. Um, but um, in the sixties and seventies, there was uh, a fair number of uh, different sets that, um, and there were these kind of like one off sets. Um, and um, but I've been buying a ton of uh, Jimi Hendrix, uh, Bob Dylan, Led Zeppelin, um, and uh, Clint Eastwood, and. Yeah, I think those, uh, and then the Beatles, um, and those were kind of like the the focus uh, for me. And then there's a couple of each of them, uh, mainly the the um, trying to find the rookie cards. Hendrix is interesting because he has cards from both Jimi Hendrix and then also the Jimi Hendrix Experience, uh, his band. Um, so in '68, which was his rookie year, '69, uh, and then a couple to the '70s, there's a couple different cards, and to find them in, in high grade is very, very rare. I mean, the pop on all this stuff is super low. And so I've been buying a couple here and there whenever I could find them. Um, and I found a, a seller um, who had a, a treasure trove. Like a lot of us, um, you know, I bought like two big cards from off of eBay. And um, and then, you know, he, after I bought the second one, he emails, and, you know, and, and says, hey, thanks for the purchase. I actually have a bunch more if you're interested. 
Uh, and I say, sure. And I, I say, I'm, I'm trying to buy as many as I can. I, I, being somewhat uh, hyperbolic, I was like, you know, uh, he, I said, I'm interested in all of them, thinking he was going to maybe have, you know, five cards, 10 cards, 15 cards, right? He had a couple hundred. Um, and uh, and so I was like, all right, uh, let's kind of man up here and figure out what I want to do. Uh, and it ended up being a, uh, a, a big deal. It was a five-figure deal. And, um, but the guy is in Indianapolis and I'm in Detroit and he wanted, uh, cash and he wanted to meet halfway between Indianapolis and Detroit. And I was like, I'm not driving in the middle of nowhere with a bag of cash to, uh, I have no idea who this guy is and, and whatever, but I really wanted the deal. And he was adamant that this was the only way he was going to do the deal. And sometimes you just have to make it work and have to, have to figure it out. Um, and so uh, a friend of mine is a Detroit police officer. And I, I was like, look, I was like, can you do me a, a favor here? I was like, I'll pay you for your time. Um, but I basically, I paid uh, for him and he went, he also was like, look, he's like, with that amount of money, he's like, we don't know what we're walking into. He's like, it's kind of like a two man job. He's like, and also he's like, I don't want to drive in the car by myself. So I basically paid for him and another officer uh, who on their off day was very nice and drove and met this guy halfway and he took a bag of money, bag of cash and, and met this guy uh, and did the transaction. He actually, uh, I mean, this is why you hire people know what they're doing. He got the guy's name ahead of time. He ran all information about the guy, found out who he is, his whole background. They, they he, he found a police station uh, halfway between Detroit and Indianapolis and they arranged to meet like in the, the, um, the parking lot of the police station, like, it was great. It was done at the highest level of security. Uh, there were no issues whatsoever. The guy got there. My guy gets on a phone. He's showing me all the cards that he's got. I mean, it was awesome. And I don't know, but I think I probably have the largest collection of Jimi Hendrix cards, uh, you know, certainly in high grade uh, that anyone has. And I think that, that is just, I think Jimi Hendrix is as important as any athlete ever. I mean, he's just so, um, so we'll see what the long-term buy that stuff is, but it's also to me, it's just so cool to have you know these cards and the, they those cards. I mean, you've seen a lot of stuff; they look so awesome, uh, and some of the pictures. And I gotta imagine. I don't know if you know this. The answer to this, I haven't been able to find the answer. I gotta imagine that these weren't licensed. I gotta imagine these are people were just these companies because a lot of them are these Swedish companies, right? I gotta imagine they were just making the cards. They weren't actually figuring out how to license this stuff, you know, back in the sixties and seventies. But PSA grades them. Um, and they're super cool. And so I got a whole bunch of, of you know, high value, uh, you know, Jimi Hendrix, high grade Jimmy value Hendrix rookies. So, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a deal. It's a great story, man. Congrats on the collection. And it doesn't matter if they're licensed or not because they're in uniform, their names totally. are on them. So who, ca who cares, right? It doesn't that's right. Matter. That's it doesn't right. It doesn't even matter. Yeah. Right. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, as, as we discussed, I'm a big fan of these old rock cards. I have a, you know, I showed you these the other day. I've got a, a few, uh, I pulled them out just to show you, but, you know, here's my, my Beatles cards. Which I just think are are phenomenal, like a really cool John Lennon right there, and the other ones I have as well. There's the whole band right there. Just just that awesome was great cards, awesome cards. I, I'm yeah. glad you're you're not buying the Marilyn Monroe's like I am, or the James Deans that I'm I'm really into. So that's okay. I think I think I like one or two Marilyn Monroe, one or two James Dean, but uh, yeah, like I said, th those are my five. What I told you uh, for on Beatles because there's I'm sure as you've noticed. There's so many Beatles cards. In fact, it's hard to even figure out, like, is there a rookie year? Um, but so for me, there's this one card. It's actually two cards. Uh, it's a it's the Beatles with Muhammad Ali uh, yeah. and Cassius Clay at the time. And there's a there's a horizontal version and a vertical version. It's from 1964. Um, and, um, you know, it's from the iconic photos when he's, like, punching them and they're all, like, you know, like, um, and, uh, and I just – you know, now I've, I've stopped buying them, but like I was for a while buying every one I could possibly find. I just think that like it, it's 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 Muhammad Ali and the Beatles. Like it doesn't get more iconic than that. So, no, I I agree, man. Like you said, they they transcend their their uh, their their art. You know, just like Absolutely. athletes transcend the sport. They they do their cultural phenomenons and global and and the audience for music is as big, if not bigger, than than that totally. of the sport. You know, it's the same. It's it really music is uh music, music, is, music is global right like basketball yeah. obviously like drives like uh, cards like more so than baseball and football because baseball and football are us only but basketball is global and music is global 
So that's what like I, I think that you know, and, and not that, that we buy them all as uh, just for the investment part of it. But I think like long term, uh, like non-sport cards and music cards are going to be just an extraordinary investment. I think of all the cards that I've bought over the last year, I think long term from an appreciation standpoint, that's going to be the highest. Yeah. OK, man, I'm going to run through the comments and then we're going to sign off. All right. We'll get uh, final final words here and we'll go through. I want to thank Trigger Finger and Smallville for reminding everybody to hit that like button. Daniel A says. Well said, Jeremy, regarding spending thousands on sports. There's always a risk in buying young players, same as buying a stock in a company without a long track record. High risk, high reward. Well said, Daniel. Rock Late Deck says, young active players are equivalent to investing in small cap companies. Goats are the large caps. I agree. Rich Frank says it's not investing. You go on to say uh, about the cards last week told us why. And I mean, I disagree with that but i'm open to discussion because maybe i'm missing something I, I do believe that cards are investments or they they totally. they they can be an investment uh troy says what a great live stream jeremy and josh we should go on for another two hours thanks so much to both of you thank you troy and thank you josh of course pick four i do not have an engelbert humphrey card i swear to god i do not i do not uh joe says the beatles sounds familiar is that a jam band hey joe <laughs> love you thanks for the lightheartedness Sharpshooter says, uh, this is what I want to look at. Jeremy, you're such an optimist. You see the positive in everything. I feel bad for people that invested in big money in a Cunha market. That money right now is basically useless until he gets back. First of all, it's not money. It's cards. It's not money. These are not realized losses. They are unrealized. Right. And I'm not an optimist. I don't see the positive in everything. I'm a realist, Sharpshooter. I'm a realist that has a very um, broad view of things. So, um you're just way you're 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 off your game tonight, sharpshooter. Although I don't know if you've been on it lately, but in any event, uh, Sanderson says, "Josh, I have the largest Jimi Hendrix card collection." Uh, I don't think you do anymore, ja, Eric. Oh, unless you're just quoting Josh, but hey, he'll take it. He'll take it. Cherry, welcome. Says so, should start stock X start doing their own in-house grading of slab cards. So let's send it raw and not need slabs. We'll keep on running through these. Thank you for the comment, Cherry. Fulu says, if you're a smart investor, next week will be the best time to buy a Cunha. I agree. Edition says, speaking of music cards, why is there so, no company that grades records? So many iconic album artworks that would look amazing in slabs. Hey, there you go. There's a potential idea for sure. Eric says, Josh, I have a large non-sport card collection. <laughs> Jeremy, hold my beer. There you go. Hey, Keith, you're a collector, Eric. I know you are. Pick four says uh, Johnny Mathis sold over 350. Great card to have. There you go. Yam, I know you're smiling ear to ear when Josh was talking about all the, uh, all, you know, all, all the, all those cards that came out, uh, who do you named a few? I knew, I just, I knew that Yam was smiling ear to ear. Mm -hmm. That's right up his alley. Rich Franks says I'm buying comics, baseball season in full swing. I don't buy in season. Hey, good strategy. If it works for you, <laughs> sharpshooter needs a name change. Yeah, I agree with that comment. And Mike Wick says, one may argue this could cause a demand for Acuna cards. As you see the remarks in this room, as people are thinking it is a time to buy. All right, That totally happens a lot where you go in there and think and everyone has the same idea. And then sometimes you actually end up you know, paying more or the cards don't go down at all because of that. And given how big of a, a star Acuna is and how, how great people think he's going to be long term, I, I, I'd be shocked if his cards move more than just a, a small amount down. Yeah. That's a fair comment too, right? Based on everything you just said. Okay, we are we are done. Um, again, everybody, thank you so much. We'll be back in a few minutes with uh, Frankie Gonzalez. Josh, thanks, man. This was awesome. Really enjoyed the conversation. Final words from you to the chat and, uh, and then we're done. No, I just thank you very much for having me. Um, this is a blast. I, I love the opportunity to go deep into some of these topics. You know, I, I, we we deviated into an economics lecture or a marketplace one on one lecture for a little bit. But like that's a really interesting thing is to go just a little bit deeper on this stuff, because these are they're extraordinarily interesting, uh, you know, ecosystem of, of what the hobby is as an asset and the businesses around it. There's a lot of really cool stuff here. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. So thank you. Yeah, man. Thanks a lot for coming on tonight, everybody. We'll be back in a few minutes. Josh, hang tight one second. And um, that's the end of the episode, everybody. Thank you so much for